24 hours, we sold out 650 tickets. Like we, we clicked on and then all of a sudden it was like 30 people signed up, then 60 people. So let me tell you though that so many people signed up right away and we had to close it down right away that we are having a waiting list. And we anticipate that as we get closer to the actual day, there are going to be people who, people who signed up right away and, you know, things can come up and they can't come. So if you are still interested in going to see Temple Grand, again, it's a free event. It's February 6th at the University Student Union at Cal State Northridge, so very close. Um, it starts at 7 p.m. She'll talk for about an hour to an hour and a half. She'll have a book signing. So if you're still interested, do email us and say, I want to be on the waiting list for Temple Grandin, and we're just, we're starting a waiting list. So that, if you're emailing us, email us at ctl at csun.edu, edu, sorry, ctl at csun.edu. The very next day, and that's why we're using Temple Grandin as a jump start, a big, huge kickstart to our What Really Works conference. We have this every couple years, every two years, we have this and we bring in big speakers and we have great keynotes. We've had the um, National Teacher of the Year. Last year we had a panel of Teachers of the Year as our keynote speakers. This year we have the 2016 California Teacher of the Year. Do you guys know where he's from? California. California. Well, he's the California Teacher of the Year, but yes, he is. Yes, yes, yes. Where is he from? He is from LA USD and he's a high school teacher. I've been talking to him and this guy has some very excellent ideas for working with kids. Um, in fact, we just had him write for our T-Care newsletter. If you guys aren't on the T-Care newsletter mailing list yet, I've told you about it a couple times, get on the mailing list. He talks about how he, in a one page article, he talks about how he uses music to engage students. And the presentation he's gonna do, he's gonna do our keynote, but an extra breakout session he's gonna do for us is called Breaking Bad Presentation Habits. Let's see, I thought he was cool. Um, anyway, he's got all these different ideas that I was just reading and talking to him and going, oh my God, why didn't I do that when I was a high school teacher? So I think he's really exciting. Um, then we also have a, a Chime teacher from Chime Charter here, and she won the presidential award for math and science. So President Obama gave her an award and like $10,000 and so she won for California. She's the science person who won for California. So that's pretty exciting. She was also my son's third grade teacher. So I can personally attest to the fact that this woman has incredible ideas and is a great teacher. Um, we have people coming in from England, Denmark, uh, we have people, the person who's doing a session on math and teaching math and engaging learners, the session's called I Hate Math. Uh, that person's from Johns Hopkins. We have people from Vanderbilt. We have people just all over. We have sessions on universal design for learning and co-teaching, but we also have math and reading at the secondary level and at the elementary level and writing and uh, working with kids with mental health issues and kids who come from difficult home situations like homelessness or um, abuse, foster homes, we have identity issues, uh, LGBTQ, we have so many different um, sessions that you can pick. In addition that day you would get breakfast, you would get lunch, you would get a bag of swag and I brought an example here today. So you get a bag and in the bag is really cool stuff. But I'm not going to show you what it is, but it's cool. And if you're interested later, you can come see. Anyway, you're going to get a whole bunch of stuff. And then the um, other thing is that you will get a free book. So I mentioned to you guys before, and you've got a flyer that Corwin Press sent us to market this. We have, the two years ago, everybody who came got to pick if they want what really works with elementary or what really works with secondary. This year, everybody gets the new book, and it's purple. Uh, what really works with exceptional learners. And we've got, again, we talk about ELL. We talk about... Um, Every disability, we talk about gifted ed, we talk about twice exceptional kids who have, are, are gifted or talented and also have a disability. In fact, one of the top experts in the nation, well, not in the nation, in the world, is coming and talking about twice exceptionality. She's from England and she's the head of schools at Canterbury Christ Church Schools. So she's coming to speak. So I'm super excited about this conference, obviously. Um, 
Hope you can come. I will tell every single one of you, even though Granada Hills is really our partner school in the CTL, it's the one that we officially have, I am giving you all permission. So I've already told my administrative assistant. Um, I'm giving you all permission. If you want to register, you have my permission to register as a partner school person, no matter what school you are at, because of my connection with Granada Hills. And that means it's a discount. So it's only $99 for the full day and you walk away with a book that's already $40 plus all that other stuff. So, so talk to your school, see if you can come. It is a Tuesday. The reason we did that is because Tuesdays are typically the PD days, uh, early release days for LAUSD. So hopefully you wouldn't have to get a full day sub. It wouldn't be as big a deal and you can totally sell the fact that you're getting incredible professional development. So if you have any more questions, you can go online or you can just come and ask me if you have any questions about the day, how it's run. Even if you can only come for the second half of the day, it will be well worth it. All right, moving on. Okay, whoops. So little review here. Let me go back, there we go. Just wanted to remind you where we've been and where we're going. And we gave you this the first day, but just to remind you, we started off the first day was just kind of reminding ourselves what co-teaching was, talking to each other about it. The next session we talked about planning. The last session we were talking about co-instructing with the different models in universal design for learning, differentiation. Um, tonight is about data, and that might not seem very sexy to some of you, but it, there's good stuff here and stuff that I hope will make you realize how you can keep moving forward, how you can take where you are and use this information to move forward without making it too onerous or too much work. Um, next time we meet in February, we're going to talk more about specifically differentiation in the co-taught setting. And the very last session will be on co-assessing. So with both of those, we'll be talking about the variety of your classes and things like that. If you, as we go along, if you guys have questions that you feel like we haven't addressed and it's hard sometimes to just do it in these little sporadic things we see, you know, see you in the evenings, but if there are specific areas that you would like me to address either with you individually or as a group, please email me. Feel free to email me directly so that I can then relate to everybody. Yeah. Maybe I have it wrong. What do um, I went by something that was next to my desk, and it's entirely possible that it was wrong. So one of us is wrong, <laughs> flat out wrong. Um, and I think we're both willing to say it could be either of us. What did the rest of you have? It would be me. So good job. I was just proud that I had something next to my desk to put this on, actually. So all right, I will make sure to switch that, and hope that I haven't already planned something for March 29th. All right, um, so today is our data-driven instruction continuous improvement model. Just as a, a sort of an overview of what we're planning to do, we have a little warm-up activity that we'll get to going. We're going to talk about the CTSS, which is the co-teaching solution system. I'll introduce it to you just as a resource. Yeah? No, March. She said March. Yeah. No, that's OK. So everyone, I will fix it, but February 22, March 29. And we'll look for Marty's emails to remind us the week before when we go, oh, right. All right, uh, we'll talk about the CTSS. We'll have dinner. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what's called the seat time process. Granada Hills has started uh, a version of the seat time process, but I'm going to introduce it to you guys so that all of you can take it, tweak it at your own individual schools and see what works for you. We'll do a little goal setting at the end of where do we want to go, how do we want to keep building on this. Everybody good? As where we're, where we're getting started? Okay. I also, I've decided that even if no one ever goes on Padlet, I'm not giving this freaking thing up. I am going to stick with it to the end. So what I did, uh, there is the, if you want to take a picture, I, this time I didn't do the uh, QR code scan in, but um, what I did, let me show ya. Okay, so there, Gesundheit, there's tonight's Padlet. And what I did was I actually put up the resources that I gave you, not all the flyers, but some of, there's a couple articles up there, there's some handouts, um, and even these books, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, 
Um, I can't give these to everybody, and some of you just won't care about them. Others of you will really want to access them and look at them. So all of the resources are up there. Some extra articles that I just don't want to kill trees. All of that stuff will be up there so that you can access it and download it. If anybody has already gone online, I'm hoping, I did it well this time, that you will be able to add your own questions. You will be able to, to download access. I made sure it wasn't uh, password protected. Uh, and I made sure that everybody could access it. So I'm going to go back to the actual code for it. All right. Any questions about Padlet? Has anybody used it yet with their class? Awesome. <laughs> Next time, yeah, couple of, you guys had last time too though, so the learning curve is still like that. Um, next time, we're meeting when? February what? 22nd. 22nd. Next time, I challenge you to have tried Padlet before then. Okay? So that next time there will be a few of you at least who will actually have done your homework, raise your hand and say, I tried it, it flopped, I tried it, it was awesome, I tried it in a different way, the kids liked it, we were able to put different ideas up there. I observed co-teachers in Arizona about two weeks ago and I saw one of the, the classes at the high school level using Padlet as they were having a discussion. It was really great. So I just challenge you to try it. All right. So we're going to do magic tablecloth. I've mentioned magic tablecloth a few times, correct? Yes. yes but we haven't tried magic tablecloth together, correct? Aha. Uh -huh. So here's what we're going to do. Yes, ma'am. I just have a question about, um, like, I'm trying to use Google Classroom. Yes. And so if you're using Google Classroom, can't you do the same kind of a thing where you can have assignments where all the kids can comment on it? I mean, is that, what's the difference between that and what's like? Yeah, yeah, so I think, and those of you who use Google, Google Classroom, please clarify and, and um, correct me if I'm wrong. So I think it's more than just commenting on some of these stuff. You can do that on Padlet, but Padlet's a little bit more like a bulletin board. So you can, you can put up a, a picture, you can comment on it, um, you can move things around, you can have discuss, different discussions on different things. I think Google Classroom is just a little bit more linear. This one's a little bit more visual. That's the way I would explain it. Does anybody want to? I agree. Sounds about that, right. And you guys who have done Padlet, would you say, did I say it about right? Okay, good. All right, good. Okay, so, and again, it, you don't have to use this. It's just nice to have different tools to, to try with kids and see what works. And some kids might say they like one over the other. Magic tablecloth. I didn't mean to yell. Magic tablecloth is one of my favorite strategies that I use with kids. What you will see around the, the room right now is that I have three magic tablecloths up. I am color coding tonight. So did everybody get a little piece of paper with a color on it? Hold it. Put it in your hot little hand. Find a little piece of paper. Make sure that you have it. We'll trust you as long as you know your color. Everybody has one, correct? Does anybody need one? OK. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to actually experience magic tablecloth. I like that. Uh, experience magic tablecloth first. Then I will explain the magic. And we will debrief on how you guys can use it in your Kotak classes. But first, we're going to experience it. So what I would like you to do, first listen to directions. So don't go yet. You're going to go to the tablecloth that matches your color. That is green. Green. Good. I, well, see, I'm not assuming that everybody knows their colors. Good. That is green. That is purple. And that is? Red pinky. So if you've got a card and you can't figure out is it red, is it pink, it doesn't actually matter. It's that one. Okay. Oh, she found purple. Awesome. Good. Okay. So everybody know what your color is? What you're going to do is we're just going to spend five minutes at that tablecloth. You're going to spend five minutes at that tablecloth. When I give you the signal, you will, and then by the way, when you, you're going to go over, you're going to pull one card, you will read it. It should tell you what to do. You will have five minutes to do that thing. When I tell you, okay, 30 seconds and we're wrapping up, that's your cue to return your card to the tablecloth so that you cannot read the writing. So when I give you the cue, we have to wrap up, what are you going to do? Nice, 
nicely said. And with such gusto, too. Thanks. All right. So you're going to return a fellow band to the right. And then I will, at, when, at my signal, not yours, at my signal, I will say rotate. We're going to rotate this way. I don't know if it's clockwise or counterclockwise, but if you are at red, you will go to green. If it's green, you'll go to purple. If it's purple, you'll go to red. Brilliant. The only participant tonight, but by the end of tonight, they will be participating too. Right now, gold star, uh, 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 so many gold stars for you. Okay, everybody good? Come on, come on. She, uh, you better get her gold stars. Preferably chocolate gold stars. Right? All right. Okay. <laughs> okay, everybody in your directions. Uh, you're going to go to that tablecloth. You will spend five minutes. I will give you a cue. You will put your card back. And when I tell you, you will rotate and we'll do it again. Go. You didn't really remember? Some of you, I got called to come over and do a quick refresher on UDL and differentiation. So that showed me as a teacher that that was good. Those people were like, okay, I remember being, you know, taught about it, but do it, do it a quick, and we did it in, what, 30 seconds? And it worked, right? I think those two people felt like, aha, right, we're good. Okay, so which one might have been um, new information? Yeah, what were we talking about in that one? Data. Data. What else? Communities of practice. Micro teaching, giving feedback. And if you guys noted on that one, I also started the little thing with today, we will be talking about such and such. So there wasn't a lot of information on there, but it kind of wets your whistle of it's, it's just starting you with something that we're going to talk about today. So it's giving you a little bit front loading. Some of you may already know a lot about those areas. And some of you, it might be, might be something new. What kind of conversations were you having over there? Did anybody have anything? Interesting? Or were you confused? Did you talk at all? <laughs> I, you seem to be talking. <laughs> yes? I think one of the things that we discussed was where do we get the information from one year to the next and how do mm. we use that information because we see different kids each year. Good it's, call. It, it's not a skills based, it's more of a content based. So. Yeah. Okay, so um, for data, what I'm hearing her say is the continuity of data and the access to data for teachers, right? Certainly there's tons of data out there, but what are we getting and then how can we use it that's not time intensive? So that's another thing. Yeah. In relation to that, we talked a little bit about um, some teachers doing diagnostics at the beginning of the semester and really kind of like, you know, basing a lot of how to approach it on the results of the diagnostics, right? And seeing what the are at. Right, and some teachers do it and some teachers don't. So the idea of diagnostics, like as, as formative assessments and finding out where people are so that you can do data-driven instruction that we're supposed to do, is definitely best practice. But then again, some of you are in the reality of, I've got a brand new curriculum, I don't know what I'm doing, I have pacing plans that tell me what I'm supposed to do and it doesn't include that. You know, how much wiggle room do I really have to, uh, to teach to my results when I'm being told everybody has to be doing the same thing. Right, so these are rea reality, you know, situations. Okay, skill building. Which one was skill building? By default. Right, what, what, what were you guys talking about in that one? Say it again. Yeah, the different approaches, right? All of you had different approaches and I was asking you to apply it to your own content, your own lesson, have a conversation about that. Um, if this were your class, if whatever content you guys teach, Think about, could you use uh, magic tablecloth in this way with your content? And it's a, not a trick question, actually. The answer is only yes. <laughs> that is the answer. I don't care what you teach. <laughs> you can use it. Um, now, I was, I, certainly if we had more like hands-on kind of stuff, I could have had you guys model something or do something. I just wanted to get through it. So, um, so the skill building wasn't as hands-on. It was more discussion-based, so I wasn't really seeing. But if I was co-teaching, I could have had a co-teacher over there saying, show me what that would look like. Draw a diagram of station teaching and explain what the issues would be. Or, you know, tell me how you would use parallel teaching when you're teaching algebra two. Okay, so I want first to do it with our content, but now I also want you to think about the magic tablecloth in your classroom. Now, I will tell you, each of these tablecloths is from Dollar Tree, which I absolutely love and go to frequently. So it costs me how much? 
Three dollars, you guys are good. Now, I wasn't sure in terms of the number of people, so I used whole tablecloths. And I want to thank Barry and Strawn for helping me put them up. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Where's Barry? Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Um, but in a typical classroom, I frequently will take these tablecloths and I will cut them in halves or quarters. You can put your tablecloth. I also ask them to tape it so that you can see the tape because sometimes people will think it's just magically sticking on the wall, and it doesn't. Um, it takes tape, but you can put it on over a door, a window, a wall, anything that you have up and then you can just keep using it. So all I did was take this adhesive spray and spray it and that's it and it's magic. So uh, a couple things I will tell you guys about the adhesive spray. First of all, um, if you live in the West Hills area, you will have a hard time finding it because I buy it out every time. <laughs> just telling you. Um, get it from Lowe's and Home Depot. Don't go to Michael's or Joann's Fabrics. They do have spray adhesive. They're like three times as expensive. You go to the, like where the paint, the spray paint kind of stuff is, and they will have the adhesive. Um, you want to get the general purpose, the lowest level that you can. If you get the really high stuff, then this, this stuff doesn't come off. And that's what's so nice about being able to move it all around. Um, so you want to be able to, you just do a light spray now. Um, I noticed that some of you have young children. If you decide to do a magic tablecloth at home, do what I did today was take it outside, spray it because it has fumes. As a high school teacher, however, I recommend to be culturally responsive. You should spray it right before the kids get in the classroom. <laughs> then your kids are like, oh, I feel at home, dude. This class is awesome. No administrators here, right? Yeah, I know. That part was a videotape, right? Okay, okay, just kidding. Anyway, so the spray bottle costs about $5, $6, so it's not very expensive, and you can keep using it over and over. The magic tablecloth becomes more tacky over time. That's like the good tacky, not the, oh my god, that's tacky. Um, it's good, so it's sticky, and you can keep using it. Um, I've had co-teachers who have told me that what they did, they liked having um, holiday themed ones, so they'd have like heart ones for Valentine's Day, etc. Then they would take it down and they'd use an empty um, wrapping paper roll and they roll it up that way and then they put it in their closet and that way they can keep taking it out, reuse it and they can have a whole bunch. So, But they're really inexpensive. So now think about the fact as we have these, and you guys can see it, I'll just model, but I know that you were seeing this, as you can move these things around, they do not have to be, you can laminate them or not. Uh, you can take them, what, are you gonna help me out? Thank you. Um, good, she's modeling for me, thank you Audrey. All right, um, easily movable, and she'll start organizing, excellent, thank you ma'am. Um, how can you use this in your class with your high schoolers? And there's a million ways, but I want to get some from you guys first. Really? Yes. <laughs> she will come and help you. Yes. I think she said, oh, good mom say, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Both of those are good. So any of you teaching sex ed, parking lot where there are anonymous questions as they leave the door so that nobody else can see and they put it so that you can't read, you know, you, you can't see their handwriting, whatever. Um, take it out the door as you ask a question, certainly. What else? Test review. Test review, so you could have a whole bunch of ones up there, they have to take it and, and answer it, see if they get it. But what I've done before is I've had, today, I would ask kids to each get an index card and write a test question, okay? that they think would be on the test. Now, because my students have a tendency to write at the level they are at, I have some questions that are all easy, some typical class questions and some really intense, difficult questions. They wrote them. I take it that evening and now what I do is I differentiate by putting a different colored dot on the back of each index card so that I know which level it is. Then I put them up all mixed up so that you can't see what they are. And as the kids come in, I know their level. So I would say, get a yellow, get a yellow, get a green, get a green, get a yellow, get a red, get a yellow, get a green, get a, as they're coming in. They're taking a question that's at their level. It also helps me when I'm designing the test because people have already given me some questions that are at different levels. Okay, so great, what's another one? Yeah. Use phrases on the cards to create independent or dependent clauses. 
Fantastic. So for English, there's so many things. Instead of us doing that, what everybody used to do, the daily oral language at the board, and then we write, and then it's wrong, and we correct it. You can create different clauses, words, put things up there. You can take a magic marker, a Sharpie, and draw on your, um, your magic tablecloth so that you could put lines if you're having them add stuff in. You can make it like a sentence diagram. You can make it a categorization for anything. So if you're doing uh, chemical periodic elements, if you're doing, you know, I mean, you guys name it, right? You can put that kind of stuff on there. What else? Um, at my school, uh, we differentiate between tier two and tier three words. Um, uh -huh. We have this nice little words to know, words to go. And so just, I've always hesitated to create a word wall because there's so much work. Yeah. This is an awesome dynamic word wall. I've seen it in math and I've seen it in language arts as, as an ongoing word wall. And you can move things over too if you feel like I've done a pre-assessment and I have a lot of kids who don't know these words, but then as you find that 80% or more have it, you move it over into the we've got these and we still have to work on those. That's great. What else? Um, could you do like a matching thing for the skill building where it's mixed up and then the students find their map, maybe it's an equation or a equivalent expression. Right. And then I, they can put it up together and I can see it. Yeah, so she's talking about equations or equivalent expressions for math. You can do that for pretty much any area. Matching is fun. So you have one word on a definition on another one. And the kids are walking around going, mitosis, mitosis. Who has a definition of mitosis? They have to find their partner. And I've done that as a ticket out the door where then they can't leave the room until they find their partner. Try and have an odd number, just a screw with somebody. <laughs> just kidding, don't do that. What else? I'll tell you another thing I've done for English. When we're reading a novel, I will again take a, a Sharpie and I will draw a person, but the outline of a per, I mean the outside, so it's more like gingerbread man, not stick figure. Then as the kids are reading, every time they identify something that is internal to the character, so a thought, an emotion, a feeling, something even they've said, or the eye color, whatever, that goes inside. It can be any, it can be a um, little piece of paper like I gave you guys, it could be index cards, anything. But then everything that's external to the character, things that actions that happen to them or that they do, that goes on the outside. Now those are around the room, so we're reading Outsiders, we've got Pony Boy and Soda Pop and Dairy and Dally and all that stuff. And then that's a test review. Just do a, uh, right before the test, they can do a gallery walk and then we take it down. And that's again the nice thing about these tablecloths is put it up, take it down, move it, you know, take it away for the test, whatever, it's easy. What else? Well, what about scientists? Come on, what can we do in science? Scientists never categorize, do they? Or classify things? No. This is so easy for classification. My creativity stops at 4 p.m. Yeah, understood. <laughs> I understood. You're off the hook. <laughs> yes? Yes. Absolutely. And then if you want to have like a challenge one, so you could have one where they only are matching up the elements, right? And then you could have another one that's a challenge of what happens if you combine elements. For those people who are like, yeah, I, I grew up knowing AU is gold, you know, whatever. That is right, right? Yeah. Okay, that's one I know. Um, anyway, so all of these things, table, uh, the magic tablecloth, really easy, super fun, and keep in mind how to differentiate is really easy too. So you can color code. Even with this, even though I had you guys do rotations, you don't have to do stations. I just wanted to get you up and get you moving and get you doing different things. But we could have easily, I could have had it leveled with different levels of questions, had you guys go, and as you came in, it kind of looks random, but I'm thinking about which one you go to. And then you go there, we're all doing algebraic equations, but they're all at different levels. Okay? And just by the fact that you went there, you got it done, I give you, it could be your warm up instead of feeling like you're doing a rotation around or um, we're wasting time or we're just sitting there and we're all doing it off the overhead. It's a little more engaging. Okay, everybody good? Yeah? Just a technical question. I have seven classes. So mm -hmm. uh, will the adhesive work for all those rotations? Yeah, just make sure that you, you do a good spray. So I was outside and kind of fast before you guys come in, but typically if I just, I put it up and I find it's easier to spray if it's on a wall than lying down. I just don't do it as well. So, but yeah, it definitely stays. And then even if you felt like you missed a corner, you do a quick pump and it's done. But yeah, it would definitely stay. 
And they're so easy too, by the way. If you guys do this, um, I have a tendency to laminate my index cards because I will use the same ones over and over. I did something new and created these for just this group, but I frequently will demonstrate magic tablecloth. And so I do it with math problems and I have them already laminated. Laminated ones were great and then I just keep them with a rubber band around them. They will stick together, but you just go, you know, you undo it and you use it again. It's really no big deal. Yeah. Dollar Tree, that's where I love it. I wouldn't go to Target or some of those places and get heavier duty ones because they just don't work as well. Plus, cheap is super good. Okay, good, I hope you guys got some ideas and also reminded yourself why we're here. Go ahead and have a seat. Can you use this as individual? For example, with math, a student gets this, they know their review questions. Sure. The information that they haven't learned or they're not familiar and this skill building what they feel they've mastered. Yeah. So like cutting them up for Absolutely. Especially absolutely. For students who then like working with Yeah, us. yeah, for sure, for sure. You can do that word absolutely. Oh, really? What time? Five forty five. Is it really? Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let me move to one thing real quick and then I will give them a break for lunch. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. If I can have your attention. Hope you're writing down magic tablecloth, go out to Dollar Tree. There was. Yeah, let me give you one more though before you write it down. There was another question about individualizing and, uh, and could you cut this into even individual ones for, for people? Absolutely, it would be great if you even want to have just one little challenge area. You could have some challenge questions up and let kids work individually on their own thing. You, that could just be up there all the time. Like if you finish your work and you want to challenge yourself, you could go up there. Or I could have certain ones with kids' names on it. So feel free to use this however you want. Let's take two minutes for you to write down these ideas. I'm going to introduce one other thing and then we're going to have lunch in just tomorrow, dinner in just a moment. So two minutes to write down your ideas. Tablet to download some of the materials that I uploaded and that's fantastic. I just want to introduce you to a concept so that you'll have some time to think about that while you are at dinner. So I know that you know this, but if we know that co-teaching takes three things, they are what? Let's try that again. The three things, the first one is, the second one is, the third one is, okay great. Like any content, it's also helpful if we have standards or we at least have competencies, we have some expectations of what does it mean if we're co-planning. One of the problems that we frequently find in co-teaching is that there's someone somewhere who was told co-teaching needs to happen at your school. And what often happens is that people are thrown into it and they don't know what it is and maybe they've taught themselves or they've gone to one professional development or something like that. You guys have been going to multiple ones but even with this, it's helpful if you can understand where you fit in the scheme of what is true co-teaching, what is mastery in co-teaching. Um, and I do have some videos, just from last week I was fortunate enough to observe a team that was definitely, they were masters. And I will explain what that means and how I identified that they were masters and uh, tell you a little bit about them after lunch, but our dinner. But when we're talking about a core competency framework, competencies are the skills that we're looking for that would show that yes, you actually have done this. It's not that today I just happened to see two of you having a great time. I've seen a lot of co-teaching where it's clear that the teachers really liked each other, but it doesn't mean they're doing anything different for kids. And if you remember, we're looking that co-teaching means you are doing something that's substantively different and better for kids than if you were alone. So that's what we want to have. So we're, we've broken this up into three things. Look for, that would mean I can walk in the room and I have certain things as an observer, whether I'm your peer, whether I'm an administrator, doesn't matter, but things that I can look for that I would know, oh good, now I know you're doing the things you're supposed to do for co-teaching. Listen for, I want to see how you and your partner talk to one another. I want to see how you talk to kids and your partner talks to kids. I also want to hear how your kids are talking to one another. Does it feel like they're all included? Are they saying kind of negative things like, oh, that was stupid, you don't get it, whatever. And then the last one is ask for. 
Ask for's are our permanent product data. That's the stuff that if I was your on-site administrator, I might say, okay, I want, to, I want proof. I need to see something to know that you're truly co-planning, not just you guys saying you do. So maybe I get a, a copy of a lesson plan. Maybe I look at your grade book. Maybe I see that both of your names are on the grade book or that you have adapted versions of certain assignments or materials or tests. That's permanent product things, things I can ask for and get in my hot little hand. As a consultant, when I go in, I don't usually ask for these things because I'm not there on a regular basis. But that's what they're broken up into. So we have 120 competencies. That's a lot. So obviously, when we go in, we don't look for 120 things. That's too much. We've broken this down into four, uh, four domains, the learner and learning, the task that they're trying to accomplish, instructional practices, and professional responsibilities. Those are the four domains. Within those four domains, we have 11 strands. We have 120 competencies, but ultimately, it's the 22 core competencies that will be on the form. And you guys all got a copy of the form when you came in. It is the one that says co-teaching core competencies observation checklist. This is also on the Padlet, so if you wanted to download it and look at it. But this gives you an idea of the 22 core competencies that if I were to come in or administrator or a peer or a colleague, these are the things that you absolutely want to be doing. And you notice there's even a little rubric in the middle that kind of gives you an idea of how would you get a zero? What is a one? What is a two? What is a three? So you would know how we score. And I know Granada Hills is very familiar with this because they've been doing this for a while. All right. Um, and it's broken up into the look for's, listen for's, and ask for's. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, I also want to tell you if you're looking for, if you want all of the, all the domains and the competencies and the strands, I did bring a few books. I'd ask you not to take them with you. Um, but I have a few books where you can take it at dinner and just flip through it, get an idea of what's here. If you do feel like, boy, I, I need this. There's, there's nothing I need more than to read about 120 competencies. If that is you, then I will tell you where you can go to get it. You can go to coteachsolutions.com and I will just, I'll keep this up here, but it's a website and if you guys look up, so everybody look on the website so I can show you where this is. Um, so it's got, you know, just all these wonderful co-teaching people, stuff like that. This green, where it says, what is co-teaching? If you click on observation checklist right there, you would get a copy of that. But if you click on co-teaching core competencies download, you will get that entire core competency framework. So it's, I don't even know how many pages, but a whole lot of pages. And it's got all the competencies, it's got all the different domains, tells you what the domains are, and then it goes through each one. Tells you what they are. You Correct. Co-teach, not co-teaching. Co-teachsolutions.com. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure that if you wanted to look at that, if you want to have an idea of what data could we collect on you, what are we looking at? How do we know what you are doing with your partner? And um, I'll show you another little thing later after dinner uh, that goes along with that. But I wanted to make that accessible to you. If you're eating and you want something to look at, you can come up with these books or you can download it on your own computer and have that. So let's go ahead and take a break. And I believe that uh, Granada is providing you guys with some paper, I think it was the, the rubric. Um, and then you can see, oh, so I said the, the half sheet of paper, the, the dark pink, is a quick overview of what to do while the full paper gives more information. It had closed procedure, so it even had places where they could put in information from notes. They were doing essays on homework. Um, they're rewriting, oh, there was a graphic organizer for those who needed or wanted it. Um, the kids in the middle were primarily working on their own, but you notice one teacher would frequently go and check with them. The other one did too whenever she needed to. There were two teacher desks in the room. Uh, they even had these cute little name tags for both of them that were the same, that both of them had their, name, their rooms in there. I uh, said that they might like the magic tablecloth. Um, I didn't notice an issue with classroom management at all, but I did ask about brain breaks. Uh, huge amounts of differentiation, different things that they had in there. They had rubrics, two different kinds of rubrics that they could use, the handout to check the spelling. 
They had a peer edit checklist, so they were doing peers. And I said, do you let the students know about this in advance so they can think about who they're sitting near in case they're sitting next to someone they don't want them to see that they don't write well? Um, there was a student with a cochlear implant, so I wanted to know what they do about that student. Do they, does he sign? Have they considered the fact that research shows um, that frequently those students, even though they can hear, they're still not accessing all language? Um, I all, throughout the period, I only noticed two phones come out, two cell phones, but they were looked at and then put right away without teacher intervention. And I just said, overall, I was really impressed with this team. They used team teaching and a modified version of station teaching. They regrouped them. Um, there was no downtime. At the end, they had a system at the back of the room. Oh, they had something that was very cool. So they had the kids a uh, paper clip, but then here, this was, they asked the kids to do this. They had a light paper, purple paper that everybody got. So at the very end, and one of the teachers even said, we have too many colors. But everybody got the same piece of paper. And it said, how did we do? And then the students up, there was a board, and it had like these um, folders stapled uh, to it. And the students were to put their reflections. They were just reflecting on whether they felt comfortable today, how much they got done, what they didn't like. And then they would be able to put it into these little folders that said, how do you do? Um, where was it? it I, had, I wrote it up there because there was it was just really cool. Um, so the kids could, could put it in whatever folder that kind of says, you know, I need more time on this, or I've got it. So they were quickly, just by where they put their reflection sheet, giving information to the teachers of, I'm ready to move on, that kind of thing, which I thought was great. They had parity, they shared, it was very easy to understand. Um, and they did ask them on that self-reflection sheet, what was challenging, what was easy, where are you in the writing process, and what do you need help with? Which was really cool. So that's an example of a full observation report. Remember, they get this email 
right away so this isn't a problem hand. Right, baby steps, yeah. So, and the idea is that you have all of this so that you can then decide, we're about to talk about you using this data, but you decide. And I, like I said, I don't know your kids, and I don't know if you didn't do something today that I said, oh, why didn't you try this? And I go, well, because I did it yesterday. But that's up to you and your partner, but now you have this to make a decision. And not everybody does the lengthy narrative that I do. That's just the way I do it. Everybody has their own way. Yes? Didn't make a big impact on people. People don't remember it. 
right? Then we have some that we're getting coaching. So ongoing observations, feedback, work with them. Um, in the University of Central Florida, University of Central Florida, they even were doing some online coaching where they're having virtual coaching where pairs sit in front of the computer for 10 minutes with a person from the university and talk about their co-teaching and get feedback that way. So there's, there's a lot of different models. Again, helpful, but didn't end up making the most improvement. The most improvement was pulling all of these pieces together in what we call sea time. So that's what we're here to hear a little bit more about. So there's a little progression, and this is something that's not specific to co-teaching. This is pretty much for teaching, and I think most of you guys know this. What the heck? <laughs> oh, maybe I walked away. Oh, wow, that's true. My computer's doing all kinds of things, isn't it? Okay. Well, I'll just uh, continue on. Wow, it completely turned off. The rain.
So they're looking at overall as a whole school, and they've got a whole recursive loop of the way that the school looks at the data. That would be what we call your school PLC. What is PLC? Professional Learning Community. Okay, so we call the PLC that the school level is looking at it. But then we look at the, the, the teachers, and for the teachers, then we have a whole loop that I'll explain. But that's all this is. So if, if you love this and want a copy of it, let me know. I'll send it to you. But I'm not planning to talk about it. I just want you to know it's there. This is, in five easy steps, this is what we're talking about for you guys using data for this to be a continuous improvement model for us. And back to what you guys remember, baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. We collect data, we analyze it, we use it to develop a plan, you take action, and you collect more data. Is that more reasonable? Yes. Good. Again, those of you who want the flow chart, I am happy to give it to you. To me, this makes sense. So as co-teachers, what kind of data would you guys be collecting on yourselves? On yourself, on your co-teaching. We're talking about your co-teaching practice. Student engagement. Certainly it could be student engagement. You could look at different ways to know student engagement, but I'll give you a hint. We've just been talking about it and looking at video, and it's in your hot little hands. That's crazy talk. What? Yeah, in a nutshell, you guys can do more. I love, you know, do student engagement, look at student grades, you know, find out about student attendance, all that stuff is great. But just to figure out how two of you guys are doing, just look at your competencies. Who could give you these competencies? Who could observe you and give you this data? A peer. Right? A TA, perhaps. So you teach them, I'm sure. Have, they have the students identify how you're doing. <laughs> your administrators, your district people, your, you know, outside consult, anybody. Because this hopefully is clear enough that people can say, oh yeah, I do see somebody started and ended on time and wasn't coming in late every minute. I do see that you regrouped kids. I couldn't tell which of you was general ed teacher and special ed teacher. So this is pretty easy data. And then you guys analyze it. This is the PDSA. This is the Plan, Do, Study, Act. So just to look at the major components that are part of this, I would like us to once again go over to the Magic Table class, go to the one you went to first, that you had that first little color. And you're trying to remember where you went first. On the, on the papers, you will see, and I just did this kind of quickly and some more falling out, but you can either grab a paper or there's also manila folders at the bottom of each and you can take out a piece of paper. You're going there for five minutes. We're not rotating this time. Just go, take a piece of paper, and in five minutes we're going to degrade. Okay, so I know not everybody had a chance to read theirs. Um, first of all, what did you guys notice about what you picked up or what your peers picked up? I got two pages. Everybody else got one. What? one That's one. because you're gifted strong. I know, I'm gifted. Right? <laughs> okay, so some of you guys, and I did this on purpose to show you just another example of differentiation. Some of you got pages that had much more information and they were longer. Some of you had adapted versions that just had like key ideas. Again, if I wanted to, I could have told you what to get, or I could have said, hey, if you want to challenge yourself, get the longer one. Um, but I wanted to show you that you can have different versions, and it has also different amounts of reading in it. So I can have everybody's attention just so that we can wrap this up. Now, let's just very quickly, somebody who's willing, where, which one was communities of practice? Who are communities of practice? Okay. Who over there would like to, in a nutshell, just tell us what is a community of practice? Okay, good. Would you come over here? Just so everybody can hear you. Yeah. 
together to problem solve. And like you said, in your situation, you're looking at videos, you're giving each other feedback as peers, and then you know, you're know you able to take that and move forward. So that's community of practice. So in a nutshell, c kind involves community of practice. Who is micro-teaching? Micro-teaching, you guys who would like to do a quick nutshell micro-teaching? Good, thank you. It's when uh, you and your co-teaching partner decide what one competency you want to look at and address, and then you film it or have colleagues watch it live and give you feedback as to if you were able to meet those or how you can improve upon it. Perfect, and the only thing I would add is micro means really short. So this could be five minutes of a lesson. Usually we say 10 to 15 minutes, and you've noticed both of them said there's a videotaping element because that allows you to go back and watch it or have your peers watch it to see how you did. Because if you do it in the moment, you don't really know if the kids are paying attention or not. Micro teaching started in teacher ed, and it has been for years and years and years and years and years used in teacher preparation. And national boards have people videotape themselves and reflect. So that micro teaching reflection is very, very important. And that community of practice is where we link those two. So we're giving each other feedback. What did you guys, speaking of giving and receiving feedback, who would give a nutshell, something that you learned in your giving and receiving feedback? Excellent, good. By the way, I come and stand next to you because we're video, we're recording this here too. Um, um, giving and receiving feedback, it's a lot about just being open. Um, so when you're giving, so do two positives and two somethings to improve on, and then we're receiving um, to, like, to confirm and hold on to the positives, and then to reflect on the improvement well, the, which require check your ego. Yes, check your ego at the door. It's really hard, but being open. And if you guys heard her say, it's the, we use the two plus two method because if you require everyone in your community of practice to give two positives and two things to improve on on that micro teaching, then that means, first of all, everybody's going to say something. You're not going to have that person who's writing papers not paying attention. But also, two positives means everybody who is observed, get something positive. And two suggestions means it doesn't matter if you're master teachers or your novices, you only get two things to work on. So in C time, these are the big picture items. This is the big stuff that you, you want. Um, anybody who wants copies of these things is welcome to get them. They're, most of them are straight from the book that we have coming out. But I just wanted to have a quick overview of what you're doing. So if you want to head back, I'll give you the last couple items and we'll head out. Score. 
Not going into detail here because that gets people really confusing, confused. But the idea is that we have this score to help you if you need help in picking and triaging your competencies. You can look at your performance score. You can look at the impact of how impactful each competency is and your e-score. And we have a little formula that helps you decide, okay, this, this would be a competency to work on as compared to others. If you're feeling like you can't pick, this gives you a little score. Then we also have forms. If you are at the school level, we call it the CAP, which is the Corrective Action Plan. If you're at the team level, so you guys as teachers, we have a form called the PLATE, which is your professional learning, wait a minute, P-L-A, actions, your professional learning actions for teacher effectiveness. Essentially, it's where you put all the data onto one form where you're able to see what should we work on you start to decide and figure out triage, what do we want to work on given all this data? It's one place to keep it all. So you've analyzed your data. You now develop a plan. That's where you're going to rank them, you're going to prioritize them because as, and I think you, you mentioned this earlier, it can be overwhelming if you have all of that data. You might have 20 competencies where you score to zero. Hopefully not. But if you do, where do you start? So you have to triage, you have to decide where do you and your partner want to start because what we don't want is for you guys to try and do everything at once. That's why the micro teaching is important is for you to start with just one thing. All right, so you pick the things that you want to do, you have your plan, you do your micro teaching where you go and you do, you do your regular lesson but for a little part of it you videotape it and you really, really work on asking questions. Or you really work on you we language, or you really work on differentiating, or you work on technology. And you videotape that little piece, and then you get with your group, that community and practice group. You all watch it. You and your partner debrief on it. You let your team give you some feedback and some ideas. They might say, well, that was really good. But you know, I just learned another app that you could use that would have been so cool. Right? So everybody's giving each other feedback and helping each other move forward. It's baby steps. It's supposed to be supportive. It's not supposed to be evaluative. And then the last part is that continuous improvement. You keep looking at your trend data, you're giving each other feedback, and you're goal setting. You're saying, how do we want to keep going? So that's why we call this a continuous improvement model. Because every person in this room could do it. Every person in this room with your partner just says, what do we want to work on? And then you start working on it a little bit. So that's it. So your big picture, you've got your co-planning, co-instructing, co-assessing, but it's on steroids because you're co-planning. Now you're including forms for feedback, competency attainment. You're planning when you're going to do your micro-teaching. You're co-instructing means you're also videotaping it now and having others observing it. And you're co-assessing as you're analyzing those. You're getting the two plus two feedback. You're putting it on a form. So it still fits in all of this. It's just pumping it up a little bit. All right, we are at the end of tonight, so I would just say for one minute, just because I know most of you are already packing up, ready to go. For one minute, talk to a partner or somebody at your school. If you're all by yourself, either talk to yourself or talk to somebody at your table. But what do you think of all these things? What's doable for you? What will you work on next? Is it that you'll talk to an administrator about micro teaching? Is it that you'll just look at the competencies? You'll work on something? What will you do that's next step? Um, can you guys just please listen for one moment? I'm interested. And uh, when we first started out on this adventure, we were like, yeah, they're crazy. Uh, but I'm going to come over here so that we can do it. You were at the they're crazy part. We were kind of like, they're crazy for us having to do all this. It's never going to happen. When are we going to have time to do it? But we've actually been able to find ways this week and put that into practice. And both of us feel like we are better educators and our students are getting better um, information because of the process. So trust it and go with it and you actually will see benefits. Thank you. Love, love, love that. And that's what we're all about is just trying to improve little, little, little by little. You don't have to be rock stars. You just have to be willing to improve. Guys, the very last thing, and I still do want you to have that one minute with your partners, but the very last thing is, we also need you, come on, ring, my super cool ring that's not working right now. There it is, at mention. Um, we do need you to do a survey. So those of you who want to do it right now and get it done, we do want to find out what your feedback is for tonight and how we can continue. So we've got it on Survey Monkey one more time. <laughs> Sorry. 
There you go. It's surveymonkey.com slash r slash g h c h s d f. So that's for tonight. Next time we're going to be talking about differentiation. So if you guys will stay for about two more minutes, one minute talk about what you plan to do, and one minute fill out the survey. And then can we give one more round of applause to Marty for helping organize all this?